Okay, here we go. Some people call the next David Koresh, welcome home. Just like Jim Jones, come on in and have a glass of Kool-Aid. We're going to sit down with Brian Wilton and we're going to talk about Thor. So <laughs> come on in and let's see what we got. Um, the information I'm going to talk about tonight comes directly out of the Prozetta. This is a, uh, from the sacredtext.com website. Um, it is the primary source for much of what we, uh, much of what we talk about. I'm going to start with Thor. There was some reason it came to my mind tonight and uh, trying to think about what I was going to talk about. And, and that was the first one. Um, chapter 21 said, then said Ganglary, what are the names of the other ace here? Or what is their office? Or what deeds of renown have they done? It's a legitimate question. If we're going to place our faith in, in a set of beings, shouldn't we be looking for who and what they might be? If we're going to believe in people and, and think about try to emulate their success, shouldn't we have the courage to say, why should I be listening to that guy? Why should I be paying attention to this person? What has he achieved in this life? What have they done? Har answered, which means high. Thor is the foremost of them. He that is called Thor of the Aesir or Oku Thor. He is the strongest of all the gods and men. He has his realm in the place called Thrudvangar. And I got a footnote here. It says that means the plains of strength. Can't verify yeah. that. And his hall is called Bilskinir from the flashing of light is the other footnote on that. In that hall are 500 rooms and 40. And that is the greatest house that men know of. It is, said, it is thus said in the Grimness Mall, 500 fours and 40, and more than 40. So I reckon Bill Skinner with bending ways of those houses that I know of hall roofed, my sons I know the most. There are some variations of that. That's a father bragging on his son's home. Most fathers will do that. Your son goes out and enjoys some success. Dad should speak highly of you. Thor has two he goats that are called Tooth Nasher, and it says here Tooth Gritter, but I have also seen Tooth Grinder, and a chariot wherein he drives. And the he goats draw the chariot, therefore is called Oku Thor. Now there's a footnote on that, and there's an important, an important uh, thought to consider here. One thing is the goats that he's talking about are not your regular little old farm goats. Um, if what we are to think of is correct, we're talking about the alpine ibex with the big long horns. Those are what are referred to as the goats. Uh, you can look at uh, from even from the Hittites and, and many of the other cultures through that area that the ibex was referred to as a goat. I suspect it's no different here. <laughs> now, Oku Thor is an interesting thing. There are a couple of etymologies the thing about etymologies of that day and age, especially in the 17th and the 18th century, and particularly Grimm, much of them are wrong, <laughs> just, just straight up wrong. According to Gleesby Vigfusson, now there's a popular etymology of Oku is not to be derived from Aka, which means to drive, but is rather of Finnish origin, Uko, being the thunder god of the Chudic tribes. Uh, in this version here, uh, the translator of Snorri's etymology, he allows it to stand. Johnson, however, allows Snorri's etymology to stand. So is it a representation of the Finnish god or is it the driver of the goat? Um, that's the kind of hair-splitting nonsense that could drive you insane. It's really not going to do anything for the deepening of your spirituality, your faith. It's a UBI. Yeah, we could know that all day long. How is that going to help me uh, deal with whether or not I put food on the table, you know what I mean? Or deal with a, a loss of a loved one or any of those other things. Those are things that when we learn those things. They're there to deepen our spirituality. They're there to deepen our faith, not be the foundation of it. And I think that's something we, we tend to get confused in when we don't see results or we don't find what we're looking for when we come here. Um, we can accumulate a lot of information as a justification for our continued use or traveling of this path, even though we don't see any results. So there's a real, there's some, that's just one of the little things that, that comes to my mind when I, when I think about following all this. I mean, for, for thousands of years, millions of people found purpose, guidance, and direction listening to these stories, and many like them concerning these beings they consider divine. 
And here we are struggling with it and trying to substitute righteous indignation or some kind of academia in lieu of a spirituality. I think there's a big struggle that we're going to have to reconcile within ourselves. We may not convince a single other person in the world of what we're trying to do here. But if in our homes, in our hearts, in our families, because that's really all we have control of, um, can we cultivate a faith out of this right here? Because this is really all we have. Be that as it may. He also has three things of great price. One is the hammer Mjolnir, which the rhyme giants and the hill giants know when it is raised on high, and that is no wonder. It has bruised many a skull among their fathers or kinsmen. He has a second costly thing, best of all, the girdle of might. When he clasps it about him, then the godlike strength within him is increased by half. And yet a third thing he has, in which there is much virtue, his iron gloves. He cannot do without them when he uses his hammer shaft. So they just dressed up a working man, farmer, warrior. They gave him a hammer to defend that which needs to be defended. They gave him a belt to give him every powerful lifter wears a belt. Lots of people wear a belt to protect their back and they put on him some gloves. Um, I can go to about any construction job site and find a guy dressed just like that. That's something that a regular man can identify with. That's something that a regular man can believe in. It's no wonder they call him the warder of men. Because that's, that's, who, that's who people are going to think about. Because um, they recognize that. It's very hard to recognize yourself in the bright, shining example of Balder or the messianic tradition of Balder's return or any of that other stuff. Though we would like to, I mean, that's the kind of the goal. I once heard it best described to me that you have, uh, you have in the center Balder, and at the top you have Odin, and over here you have Tyr, and over here you have Thor, and down here you have Freya. If you go too far in any one direction, you go to an extreme that doesn't fit in with much of what we're trying to accomplish. If you go too far with Odin, you'll be some madman dressed up in a robe, sitting in the closet trying to carve runes out of blood and all this other nonsense, and you won't be able to relate to anybody. There's no wisdom in that. If you go too far towards Tyr uh, and his mindset, you're this authoritarian kind of dickhead that thinks he knows it all and is going to be my way of the highway. If you go too far towards Thor, it becomes this uh, almost kind of a big jock bully athlete uh, mindset. And, there's, and so if you go too far towards Freya, uh, perhaps it's this per, it can be perceived as this person of loose moral character. Now, all of those extremes, when we try to bring it towards the middle, we find, we find Balder. That's a that's hard image to try to sell to people. Um, to be this, although the Greeks sometimes referred to it as the golden mean, and I'm not talking about the mathematical formula, I'm talking about that well-rounded individual. He's not too much of a jock. He's, he's athletic. He's educated. He's intelligent. He's compassionate. Uh, he has wisdom. That's a well-rounded man. I think sometimes we, we kind of miss that point when we're trying to cultivate an image of what we want to become if we follow this path. Um, Thor is the good place to start. Here's a, here's a being it's got a working tool that he, can, that he defends with, obviously, the hammer. Everyone's familiar with the hammer. The blacksmith has his gloves. He has his belt. Um, that's where we start. That's our entryway into this, into this pantheon of gods. Some women may find a path through Freya, uh, the single mother who is looking for love, who raises two children that are literally represent, her names mean beauty or treasure. But for most of us, Thor is the, is the way we come in here. <laughs> because we can identify with that. Now, if we go down here, that's just an introduction to who he is. But no one is so wise that he can tell all his mighty works. Yet I can tell you so much of tidings of him that the hours will be spent before all that I know were told. So he's taking care of business. And that's kind of what we need to be thinking about. If we're going to be those types of working individuals, we need to think about, are we working? Are we putting in that same kind of effort day in and day out to be the well-respected individual we want to become? 
But what I want to talk about was this bamboozling of Thor, because there's, hey, it's Thanksgiving, it's time for a story, and it's Sunday night. But I think that in that story, there is a message. And it starts with a couple of kids. If I can get to it. Here it is. <laughs> so, and Glary is talking to the to these high, equally high, st higher still, and equally high about these deeds of the gods. Um, and he asked him the tough one. Okay, what has he ever failed at? Has he never succeeded in winning a victory? Because all are bound to believe that Thor is the mightiest. And then said Ganglary, it seems to me that I must have asked you touching this matter what no one is able to tell of. So he calls him on it. It's like, oh, so maybe he did have a failing. Maybe he was, didn't rise to the top on every occasion because that's also something we can identify with. We don't always succeed. Sometimes, sometimes we take off on a course of action that doesn't necessarily result in, in the success we envisioned. And then said half an hour, we have heard say concerning some matters which seem to us incredible, but here sits one near at hand who will know how to tell true tidings of this. Therefore, thou must believe that he will not lie for the first time now who never lied before. And Glary said, here will I stand and listen. If any answer is forthcoming to this word, but otherwise I pronounce you overcome, if you cannot tell that which I ask you. So we're challenging him. He's throwing out a challenge. He's saying, look here, these guys ain't never lied before. And Ganglary said, we'll spill the beans, buddy. Then said 3D. Now it is evident that he is resolved to know of this matter, though it seemed not to us an unpleasant thing to tell. This is the beginning of the tale. Oku Thor drove forth with his he goats and chariot. And with him, that with him was that called Loki. They came at evening to a husband, husband man's, and they received a night's lodging. About evening, Thor took his he goats and slaughtered them both. And after that, they were flayed and borne to the cauldron. When the cooking was done, then Thor and his companions sat down to supper. Thor invited to meet with him the husband man and his wife and their children. The husbandman's son was called Thialfi, and the daughter Roskva. Then Thor laid the goat hides further away from the fire and said that the husband man and his servant should cast the bones on the he-goat. The Alfie, the husband's man's son, was holding a thigh bone of the goat and split it with his knife and broke it for the morrow. And there's a couple of versions of that tale, and one of them is that Loki whispered to him and said, I'd eat the best part of, the, of this meal. Go for the morrow. And that, that indulgence costs him. Thor tarried there overnight, and in the interval, interval before day, he rose up and clothed himself, took the hammer and mule there, swung it up, and hollowed the goat hides. So this is one of the three or four occasions where we see Mjolnir actually perform that holy duty. This one in particular, it is restoring life. It is there's something in, when he hallows the boat. When Balder dies, it doesn't restore life. It sends it on its way in the proper fashion. Straightway the he-goats rose up, and then one of them was lame in a hind leg. Thor discovered this and declared that the husbandmen or his household could not have dealt wisely with the bones of the goat. He knew that the thigh bone was broken. There's no need to make a long story of it. All may know how frightened the husband must have been when he saw how Thor let his brow sink before his eyes. But when he looked at the eyes, then it seemed to him that he must fall down before their glances alone. So... He put on his, he gave me a full face. I don't know if you've been driving in traffic and somebody drives by you and you've un, inadvertently upset them and they drive by and they give you the old full face as they drive by. Thor threw a full face at this couple and they, and it scared them. So now they're going to figure out what they're going to do. Thor clenched his hands on the hammer shaft so that the knuckles whitened and the husband man and all his household did what was to be expected. They cried out lustily, prayed for peace, offered in recompense all that they had. But when he saw their terror, terror, 
Then the fury departed from him, and he became appeased and took of them in atonement their children. And that's a hell of a thing to happen, isn't it? And it's one of the few times we see in, in our pantheon, you see it oftentimes in the Greek where the arrogance of some family offends the gods and the child is punished or someone's turned into a monster or turned into a flower or some kind of nonsense like that. Um, and this is one of the few times we see it here and we see it from the warrior of men of all places. It's kind of a reminder that as comfortable as we might feel, and I, you know, you see these basement dwellers sitting there um, having a beer with Thor, good buddy Thor in their mother's basement on the couch. Um, there's something more to it. There's something a hell of a lot more to it. This warder of men is also has a terrifying aspect that we have to contend with. Um, that little indulgence in direct opposition to what these, what this God has said, Hey, Let's be wise about this. Don't break these bones. He did it anyway. So now <laughs> the ideas of greed and ego and I ought to be unworthy to have this. It really doesn't matter. Um, now this family loses their children. And when you read the story about Loki whispering into the ear of that young man telling him to go for it, it really does makes sense that his ego is telling Miss Theophy, who is one of the fastest runners of mankind, um, hey, I'm worth this. Well, sometimes we don't need to go overboard. Sometimes we just need to be grateful for what we have and enjoy it and see what happens after that. It's always that greedy aspect that, that suckers people in. And in this case, this family has lost their children. They gave them an atonement, the Alfie and Rospa, who then became his bond of servants, and they follow him ever since. This was not an uncommon occurrence among the people of the North, if they, especially with regards to gambling. <laughs> gambling was that, the casting of lots was that idea of winning at the casting of lots, it means that there you were doing things right, luck was on your side, uh, you were living a right life, it was the surest expression that you were, doing the, you were doing what you were supposed to be doing, and they would get carried away with it. And when they lost, they would go into an indentured servitude. They would become bond of servants, as, in, a, in a manner of speaking. <coughs> Thereupon, he left his ghost behind and began his journey eastward toward Jotunheim and clear to the sea. And then he went out over the sea, that deep one. But when he came to land, he went up and with Loki and Thialfi and Rosco with him. Then, when they had walked a little while, there stood before them a great forest, and they walked all that day till dark. Theophi was swift as footed of all men. He bore Thor's bag, but there was nothing good for food, because he eats his goats. As soon as it had become dark, they, they sought themselves a shelter for the night, and found them a certain hall, very great, and there was a door in the one end of equal width with the hall, wherein they took up quarters for the night. But about midnight, there came a great earthquake. The earth rocked under them exceedingly, and the house trembled. Then Thor rose up and called to his companions, and they explored further, and found in the middle of the hall a side chamber on the right hand, and they went in. Thor sat down in the doorway, but the others were farther in front in from him, and they were afraid. But Thor gripped his hammer shaft and thought to defend himself. Then they heard a great humming sound and a crashing. But when it drew near to dawn, then Thor went out and saw a man lying a little way from him in the wood. And that man was not small. He slept and snored mightily. Then Thor thought he could perceive what kind of noise it was which they heard during the night. He girded himself with his belt of strength, and his divine power waxed, and on the instant the man awoke and rose up swiftly. And then it is said, the first time Thor's heart failed him, to strike him with the hammer, he asked him his name. <coughs> So Thor, at his most powerful, finds his heart failed him. And that would be quite a failing for the warrior of men, wouldn't it? To come across something so gigantic to seem unassailable. To come up to a problem in life that seems to be so overwhelming that we don't think we have it within ourselves to handle what we've got to do. Well, we've got to give it a shot. We've got to give it a shot. 
He asked him his name, and the man called himself Scrymir. When I have no need, he said, to ask me for thy name, I know that thou art Asathor, but what hast thou dragged away my glove? Then Skirnir stretched out his hand and took up the glove, and at once Thor saw that it was with that which he has taken for a hall during the night. And as for the side chamber, it was the thumb of the glove. Skrymir asked whether Thor would have his company, and Thor ascended to this. Then Skrymir took and unloosened his provision wallet and made ready to eat his morning meal and Thor and his fellows in another place. Skrymir then proposed to them to lay their supply of food together, and Thor sent him. Skrymir bound all the food in one bag and laid it in his own back. He went before during the day and stepped with very great strides, but late in the evening, Skrymir found them night quarters under a certain great oak. Then Skrymir said to Thor that he would lay him down to sleep, and do ye take the provision bag and make ready for your supper. Thereupon Skrymir slept and snored hard, and Thor took the provision bag and set about to unloose it. But such things must be told as will seem incredible. He got no knot loosened, and no thong in stirred, so as to be looser than before. When he saw that his, might, his work might not avail, then he became angered, and gripped the hammer Mjolnir in both hands, and strode with great strides to that place where Skrymir lay, and smote him in the head. Can't fault him for that. Scrymir awoke and asked whether a leaf had fallen upon his head or whether they had eaten and were ready for bed. Thor replied that they were just about to go to sleep and then they went under another oak. It must be told thee that there was no, was then no fearless sleeping. At midnight, Thor heard Scrymir snored and slept fast so that it thundered in the woods. And then he stood up and went to him shook his hammer eagerly and hard, and smoked down upon the middle of his crown. He saw that the face of the hammer sank deep into his head, and at that moment, Skrymir awoke, arid, and said, What is it now? Did some acorn fall on my head? Or what is the news with thee, Thor? But Thor went back speedily and replied that he was but then new wakened, and said that it was then midnight and there was yet time to sleep. So Thor's come up against two problems now he can't handle. So what he tries to do is eliminate the problem. But every time he gives it a shot, he finds that even his best efforts fail. How often do we come up against a problem where we look at it and we try and then we just give up? There's going to be no success if we give up. We've got to try, try again. And that's what Thor tries to do. Thor mediated that if he could get to strike him a third blow, never should the giant see himself again. He lay now and watched where the Skrymir were soundly sleeping yet. A little before day, when he perceived the Skrymir must have fallen asleep, he stood up at once and rushed over to him, brandished his hammer with all his strength, and smote upon that one of his temples which was turned up. The Skrymir sat up and stroked his cheek and said, some birds must be sitting in the tree above me. I imagined when I awoke that some dirt from the twigs fell upon my head. Art thou awake, Thor? It will be a time to arise and clothe us, but now you have no long journey forward to the castle called Utgard. I have heard how ye have whispered among yourselves that I am no little man in stature, but ye shall see taller men if ye come into Utgard. Now will I give you wholesome advice. Do not conduct yourselves boastfully, for the henchmen of Utgard or Loki will not well endure big words from such swaddling babes. Now you just completely insulted him. But if not so, then turn back, and I think it were better for you to do that. But if you go forward, then turn to the east. As for me, I hold my way north to these hills, which ye may, ye may, which ye may house see. Scrymer took the provision bag and cast it on his back and turned from there across the forest. And it is not recorded that the Aesir bet him Godspeed. He just got defeated. He put his best foot out there and got laughed at. Not only did he get laughed at, he got insulted. He laid the holy smack down on that candy ass and they laughed at him. <clears throat> I can think of a few times in my life where I've tried that same thing and they laughed at me. <laughs> 
Thor turned forward on his way and his fellows and went onward till midday. Then they saw a castle standing in a certain plain and set their necks down on their backs before they could see up over it. They went to the cattle and there was a grating in front of the castle gate and it was closed. Thor went up to the grating and did not succeed in opening it. But when they struggled to make their way in, they crept between the bars and came in that way. They saw a great hall and went thither. The door was open and they went in and saw there are many men on two benches. Most of them were big enough. Thereupon they came before the king Utgard and Loki and saluted him. But he looked at him, he looked at them in his own good time. So he's blowing them off. And smiled scornfully over his teeth and said, It is late to ask tidings of a long journey, or is it otherwise than I think that this toddler is Oku Thor? Yet thou mayest be greater than thou appearest to me. What manner of accomplishments are those which thou and thy fellows think to be ready for? You know, that's pretty true, too. If you're going to jump up like you're going to be king of the world, if you're going to run in there like John Wayne, you better be ready to act like John Wayne and give it all you got. No one shall be here with us who knows not some kind of craft or cunning surpassing most men. So he's got a hall of champions there. Then spoke the one who came last. That was called, that who was called Loki. I know such a trick, which I am ready to try. Of course, the ego is going to jump in there first. That one that represents the uninspired human intellect. Yeah, give him an opportunity to show off and he's going to try. Okay. <laughs> But there is no one within, within here who shall eat his food more quickly than I. Pretty good way to get a free meal. Then Utgard Loki answered, That is a feat if thou accomplish it, and this feat shall accordingly be put to the proof. He called to the farther end of the bench that he who was called Logi should come forth on the floor and try his prowess against Loki. Then was a trough was taken and borne in upon the hall fo floor and filled with flesh. Loki sat down at the one end and Loki at the other, and each ate as fast as he could. And they met in the middle of the trove, but by that time Loki had eaten all the meat from the bones. But Loki likewise had eaten all the meat and the bones with it, and the trough too. And now it seemed to all as if Loki had lost the game. I'll tell you what, it looks that way, but Loki just got a meal. That, uh, that smart aleck went in there and figured out how to hustle a meal out of these guys that are bamboozling everybody else. Uh, all the rest of these people are sitting around hungry. <laughs> I don't care if I lost, I got him. So I'm going to count that as kind of a win on his part, and I don't usually think much of him, but he got over on that one. Then Uthgard Loki asked what yonder man could play at. And Theophi answered that he would undertake to run a race with whomsoever Uthgard or Loki would bring up. Then Uthgard or Loki said that that was a great good accomplishment, and that there was a great likelihood that he must be well endowed with fleetness if he were to perform that feat. Yet he would speedily see to it that the matter should be tested. Then Uthgard and Loki arose and went out, and there was a good course to run over the level plain. Then Uthgard and Loki called to him a certain lad who was named Hugi. Short for Hugin, thought. And bade him run a match against the Alfi. And when they held the first heat, and Hugi was so much ahead that he turned back to see, meet the Alfi at the end of the course. Then said Uthgard and Loki, Thou wilt need to lay thyself forward more, Theophi, if thou art to win the game. But it is nonetheless true that never have any man come hither who seemed to be fleeter afoot than this. Then they began another heat. And then Hugi had reached the course's end and was turning back. There was still a long bolt shot to Theophi. Then spake Utgard and Loki. Theophi appears to me to run this course well, but I do not believe of him now that he will win the game but it will, be, it will be made manifest presently when they run the third heat. Then they began the heat. But when Hugi had come to the end of the course and turned it back, the had not had not yet reached mid course. Then all said that the game had been proven. Next, Uthgard and Loki asked Thor what feats there were which he might desire to show before them. Such great tales of men have made of his mighty works. Then Thor answered that he would most willingly undertake to contend with any in drinking. It's kind of, here's hold my beer. So this is like a, a, a Nordic version of the redneck saying, hold my beer. Uh, and here we were off on it. <laughs> and Carl Loki 
said that he, that might be well. He went into the hall and called his serving boy and bade him bring the scald's horn, which the henchmen were wont to drink of. Straight away, the serving lad came forward with the horn and put it in Thor's hand. Then said Usgard Loki, it is held that this horn is well drained if it is drunk off in one drink. But some drink off in two, but no one is so poor a man at drinking that it fails to drain off in three. Thor looked upon the horn. It did not seem big to him, and yet it was somewhat long. Still, he was very thirsty, and he took and drank and swallowed enormously and thought that he should not need to bend oftener to the horn. But when his breath failed and he raised his head from the horn and looked to see how he had gone with the drinking, it seemed to him that there was very little space by which the drink was lower now on the horn than before. Off to a bad start. It's a bad sign, buddy. Then said Uthgar Loki, it is well drunk and not too much. I should not have believed if it had been told to me that Ace of Thor could not drink a greater draught. But now thou wilt wish to drink it off in another draught. So he's telling you, you got a second chance. Regular, regular people get it in two drinks. You, we'll, we'll deal with you. Thor answered nothing. He set the horn to his mouth, thinking now that he should drink a greater drink, and struggled with the draught until his breath gave out, and yet he saw that the tip of the horn would not come up so much as he liked. When he took the horn from his mouth and looked into it, it seemed to him as if it had decreased less than the former time. But now there was clearly apparent lowering in the horn. Then said Utgard or Loki, How now, Thor, thou wilt not shirk for one more drink, then may he well for thee? If thou, if thou now drink the third drop from the horn, it seems to me as if this must be esteemed the greatest, but thou canst not be called so great a man here among us as the Aesir call, call thee. So he's just telling him, look, you, you might be great among these fellows, but you come over here, you, you really ain't anything. Um, I remember being fairly prominent in my unit, and when I went to the Special Forces Assessment and Selection course, and I'm on a five, timed five mile run, I remember looking up at all of these other individuals and realizing I'm giving it 110%. I'm just middle of the pack. Uh, that's a hard thing to deal with for somebody that's pretty proud of what they've done and what they've accomplished to realize, hmm, I'm really just kind of average. But how we deal with that is even more important. Then Thor became angry and set the horn to his mouth and drank with all his might and struggled with the drink as much as he could. And when he looked into the horn, at least some space had been made. Then he gave up the horn and would drink no more. I give up. I'm not going to try anymore. This is stupid. Well, it was stupid. Then said Utgard Loki, now it is evident that thy prowess was not so great as we had thought it to be. But wilt thou try thy hand at more games? May give you a shot at redemption. Um, it may readily be seen that thou gettest no advantage hereof. Thor answered, we'll make trial yet of other games, but it would have to seem wonderful to me when I was at home with the Aesir if such drinks had been called so little. But what game will you now offer me? Then said Utgard Loki, young lads here are wont to do this, which is thought of small consequence. It is the pastime of boys. Lift my cat from the earth. But I should not have been able to speak of such a thing to Ace of Thor if I had not seen that thou hast far less in thee than I had thought. That's a heck of a, that's a heck of a, that's almost like a bless your heart kind of thing to be said to a man. That you can compete with the boys because the men are going to drink from this horn and here's a cat, play with the kitty cat. Thereupon he leaped forth on the hall, a gray cat and a very big one. And Thor went to it and took it with his own hand under the middle of the belly and lifted up. But the cat bent into an arch just as Thor stretched up his hands. And when Thor reached up as high as he could at the very utmost, then the cat lifted up one foot. And Thor got this game no further advanced. So he managed to pick up a slinky little cat and got one foot off the floor. Then said Utgard to Loki, this game went even as I had foreseen. The cat is very great, whereas Thor is low and little beside the huge men who are here with us. Then said Thor, little as ye call me, let anyone come up now and wrestle with me. Now I am angry, 
So he's got a case of the ass. These people are making fun of him. They're making him look like a fool. He's supposed to be top dog order of men. I got this, carrying a hammer, wearing gloves and a belt. And these jokers are uh, making him look like a fool. <laughs> then the Hootgard Loki entered, looking about him on the benches and spake, I see no such man here within who would not hold it a disgrace to wrestle with thee. And yet he said, let us see first. Let the old woman, my nurse, be called hither. Ellie, let Thor wrestle with her if he will. She has thrown such men as have, as have seemed to me lo, no less strong than Thor. An old woman nurse? Straight away there came into the hall an old woman, stricken in years. Then Uthgard or Loki said that, that she should grapple with Asa Thor. There is no need to make a long matter of it. That struggle went in such ways that the harder Thor strove in gripping, the faster she stood. Then the old woman essayed a hold, and then Thor became totty on his feet, and their tuggings were very hard. Yet it was not long before Thor fell to his knee on one foot. Then Utgard and Loki went up and bade them cease the wrestling, saying that Thor should not need to challenge more men of his bodyguard to wrestling. By then it had passed toward night. Utgard and Loki showed Thor and his companions to a seat, and they tarried there the night long in good cheer. I don't know how they would do it in good cheer because they just got made fools of, but they did it. They tarried the night long, but as morning, as soon as it dawned, Thor and his companions arose, clothed themselves and were ready to go away. I would be too. If I got made a fool like that, I'd be ready to go away quick too. Then came Utgard and Loki and caused a table to be set for them. And there was no lack of good cheer, meat and drink. So they took care of them. They showed hospitality. So as soon as they had eaten, he went out from the castle with them. And at parting, Utgard and Loki spoke to Thor and asked how he thought his journey had ended or whether he had met any man mightier than himself. Thor answered that he could not say that he had not got much shame in their dealings together. Not guilt, shame. But ye, I know that you will call me a man of little might, and I am ill content with that. Then said Utgard Loki, now I will tell thee the truth. Now that thou art out of the castle, and if I live and I'm able to prevail, then shalt thou never come into it. And this I know by my troth, that thou shouldest never come into it. If I had known before that thou hadst so much strength in thee, and that thou shouldest no nearly have had us in great peril. But I made ready against thee eye illusions, and I came upon you first time in the wood. And when thou would have unloosed the provision bag, I had bound it with iron, and thou didst not find where to undo it. So he's already tricked him. The next thou didst smite me three blows with the hammer. The first was least, and yet it was so great that it would have sufficed to slay me if it had come upon me. Where thou sawest near my hill a saddleback mountain cut into the top into three square dales, and one of the deepest, those were the marks of thy hammer. He shaped a mountain range with those blows. I brought the saddle back before the blow, but thou didst not see that. So it was also with the games, in which he did contend against my henchmen. That was the first which Loki did. He was very hungry and ate zealously, but he who was called Logi was wildfire, and he burned the trough no less swiftly than the meat. But when Thialfi ran the race, with him called Hugi. That was my thought. And it was not expected of Thialfi that he should match swiftness with it. Moreover, when thou didst drink from the horn and it seemed to thee to go slowly, then by my faith, that was a wonder. I should not have believed possible the other end of the horn was out in the sea, but thou didst not perceive it. But now, when thou comest to the sea, thou shalt be able to mark what a diminishing thou hast drunk in the sea. This is henceforth called the ebb tides. And again, he said, it seemed to me not less noteworthy when thou didst lift up the cat and to tell thee truly, then all were afraid who saw how thou didst lift one foot clear of the earth. That cat was not as it appeared to thee. It was the Midgard circle, which lies about all the land and scarcely does its length suffice to encompass the earth with head and tail. So high didst thou stretch up thine arms that it was but a little way more to heaven, and it was a great marvel concerning the wrestling match, 
when thou didst withstand so long and didst not fall more than on one knee wrestling with Eli, since none, none such has ever been and none shall be, if he becomes so old as to abide old age, that she shall not cause him to fall. And now it is truth to tell that we must part, and it will be better on both sides that ye never come again to seek me. Another time I will defend my castle with similar wiles or with others, so that ye shall get no power over me. When we, I want you to imagine an elder of a village sitting around a fire in some wintertime hut or cabin or whatever they happen to live in or great hall telling that story to the children of the village, to the mothers and the fathers of the village, some elder telling that story of the warder of men, Thor, the lord of the storm, the possessor of Mjolnir with the girdle of might and, and, and great gloves to handle that such a great thing, the wife of Sif, the son of Odin and, and Yord, <laughs> that he failed. It seemed like everything was going wrong. He was in there giving it his level best, doing everything he could. His partners were all on the same team, doing their level best, giving it all he's got and coming up short again and again and again. If you're a young man and an elder tells you this tale, that this God did his best, but then we found out he was bewitched. He was lied to. He was deceived and bamboozled. Why, I think that might be a fine source of inspiration for those young people that grow up to serve their community, to protect their families, to defend their lands, to go out there and give it their level best every single day. And I think it means the same thing for us. We have a lot of things. We, have, we don't have Utgard Loki. We have the evening news. <laughs> we have social media telling us all kinds of things we need to struggle against. The only thing we need to be struggling for is going out there and give the best we can at what's in front of us. We don't need to be paying attention to all of these things or ideas that would seek to sucker us off course. So when I read that story, I see a great story. I see one of those tales that probably provide a direction for men in the darkest of moments to keep trying, for women in the darkest of moments to keep trying. So I think for our Thanksgiving, I think that's, that's kind of what I, I was thinking about, even in the darkest of times, don't give up. Don't give up, put forth your best foot, struggle with it just a little bit more and try one more time, no matter what anybody says. They're making fun of you. They're calling you a loser. They're saying you're not as strong as they are. You're not worth it. You're not what you say you are. Blah, blah, blah. Keep trying. Then he goes out and catches that serpent, starts whooping everybody's ass. I mean, he gets pissed about it. He gets carried away. <laughs> but be that as it may, I appreciate everybody's time tonight. That's really all I wanted to talk about. You just keep trying because it means a lot to everyone around you. Um, you are the example of what it means to be uh, also true to all of those who are in your immediate circle. You are the example of what it means to live this life. And we can't give up. We can't expect someone else to do it for us. We can't fall back on being a victim that we didn't really know about and there's some great conspiracy or any of that other stuff. We are the example, and it's the only one most people will ever see. So don't give up. Knuckle down and try even harder. I appreciate your time, folks. Does anybody have any questions? Nope? Okay. Hey, thank you very much, Brian. I appreciate it. You're welcome, man. Thank you for joining in. I appreciate it. All right, folks, I appreciate everybody coming in. I'm going to stop the recording and I'm going to